now we're going to get that FOMO top. And in the past, that's gone to 2.3 times fair value. So when fair value was 30,000 in the last cycle, we got to 68, 69. This time, uh, let's say we only get two times because there's not as much leverage this time because they cracked out on Binance and others. So let's say we get two times, that'd be 150. I think that's baked in the cake. So anyway, that's a long answer to your simple question. That's exactly- why, why are ETFs important? They're important, they're really important. And it's because the demand isn't going away. That demand, I'll make a big statement. And I've said this a couple of times on Twitter. I believe this year in 2024, which by the way, is the first year of this epic, the blockchain era, the truth net, as I call it. Um, I believe more money will be converted from fiat to Bitcoin than the previous 15 years of Bitcoin's existence. I think upwards of $300 billion is going to get converted into Bitcoin uh, this year. Big number. The biggest Bitcoin bull run in history has now begun. In 2024, over $300 billion will be converted into Bitcoin and this will propel Bitcoin's price to over $150,000 by the end of the year. This is the latest message out from Mark Yusko. Recently, Mark spoke about the first month of the Bitcoin ETF's trading and the current crypto cycle. Despite initial skepticism, BlackRock's demand for Bitcoin has blown away everyone's expectations, which bodes extremely well for Bitcoin in 2024. Mark remains bullish on Bitcoin's long-term prospects, foreseeing a significant influx of capital throughout 2024. He anticipates larger players, like central banks, entering the market, further legitimizing Bitcoin as a global financial asset. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Yusko gives his updated price prediction for Bitcoin in this crypto summer. Also guys, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy staying up to date with finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. Now here's why Mark Yusko thinks the 2024 bull run will be the biggest bull run in history. Of the story, go from this will never happen, right? So, you know, last June, BlackRock uh, applies and was like, no, it'll never happen. I'm like, are you joking? BlackRock just told you it's going to happen. And so then it was like, well, when it's going to happen? Well, it's probably going to happen in that January window. Uh, I really thought it was going to happen on the King's birthday, but uh, they waited till the 11th. So the 8th is, you know, the King's birthday. But bottom line is, uh, everybody's like, oh, no, it's a buy the rumor, sell the news. And the buy the rumor part worked, right? We went from kind of 40,000, 38,000, pumped all the way to 48,000. And and look, there was some shenanigans, shall we say, going on. Um, there's this guy, I think it's like CC15. I should give him better credit on Twitter. Uh, he was tracking these wallets that were just every day, buying, buying, buying. And it was like, wait, the DTF hasn't been approved. Who is that? And I would argue, no knowledge, but I would argue that was probably an account associated with or affiliated with or friendly with uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, somebody who was accumulating because they all believed, as, as I do, that this is a monster development, like way bigger than people think. And the issue is we just shifted the aggregate demand curve. Right. So when you sh when you have supply curve, demand curve and you shift the aggregate demand curve, the price goes up. So fundamentally, the price is going to go up. And they're like, no, no, no. Look, right after they went down, I'm like, OK. So what you saw was in the short run, there was liquidations from GBTC. They were kind of offsetting the early flows. You had a bunch of the big dogs like Vanguard and UBS and Bank of America said, no, you clients can't buy this. Really? You're going to tell me I can't spend my money on something that I want to buy? Buy Vanguard. You know, like literally people should, and they did leave. Now, the flip side of that is someone has to be that, 
you know, staid, stodgy institution for the old folks to hold their stuff and not go after these Ponzi schemes, whatever. So not all of the capital that was captive is going to rush into ETFs all at once. So that was first. Second, some other shenanigans, very little discussed thing, Austin, was the same day, January 11th, there was a new set of futures released on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Nobody was talking about it. And if you go back at the previous two, December 17th, 2017, and November 6th, 2021, those were tops, right? Where the future allowed the big organizations to get short and push the price down. Well, that certainly happened in that first week. So you had GBTC liquidations, you had um, the FTX liquidation, you had the shorts coming in. And yeah, we went from 48 down to 38 and just retraced that whole period. Remember that? See, told you, total failure. Well, last time I checked, right before we got on air, it was 52 again. And that's a big move. Well, what happened? The demand curve shifted out. The demand, the amount of new demand for Bitcoin from my brethren and sister, right? I'm a boomer and, you know, all the other boomers out there, they're not going to get a ledger and buy it direct. They're not, right? Most of them. What are they going to do? Some will open a Coinbase account, like my dad, and he has a Coinbase account. He doesn't own Bitcoin then. You tell my dad he doesn't own Bitcoin. Fine. Um, but a bunch of them are going to say, hey, Buy me some of that IBIT. You know, BlackRock's, you know, advertising this IBIT thing. Buy me some of that. And so that's going to happen. Look, we're in crypto summer. And crypto summer is a period where we're going to drift slowly, series of higher highs and higher lows. So not without volatility. We're going to drift slowly toward fair value. Well, why is that? Well, after crypto winter, okay, and you bottom them, you get crypto spring, we just kind of bounce around the bottom and it's kind of yuck and not a lot happens. Well, then crypto summer happens where the investors come back, right? They've gotten over losing money and they come back and they're like, hey, wait, if the fair value is 52K, and I was rounding instead of 50, but you know, according to Tim Peterson's Metcalf's law model, the, the fair value is 52. So we were at, you know, in the in the 30s, we're gonna drift toward that 52 number by the halving. But the caveat I said is if, and I, th- I might have said when, when you know they crowned the king, the BlackRock was gonna get crowned. Now I didn't think they'd do all nine. I actually didn't. Um, but that's even better because that's more demand. And so as we've come closer to fair value, now we've totally uh, completed that segment of, of the move. Well, now we focus on the next thing, which is the aggregate supply shift. So the halving, you know, now it's scheduled for like April 8th. Originally it was early May, and then it was, you know, for a few days it was 420 and everybody was freaking out. And now it looks like it's the 8th, which I think is ironic in that that's the solar eclipse date. So I I think that's kind of a wild, wild coincidence. Um, Not planned, I don't think. But uh, anyway, so when we have the fair value doubles. Well, no, 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 that's, that's not how it works. I'm like, well, no, that's exactly how it works. Because if you cut the block rewards in half, half of the miners would go out of business because their costs are fixed. So the price in historical halvings has doubled. Not immediately, but over time. Now, I I don't know if we talked about this or not, but I've kind of changed my thinking on that, that because of ordinals, because of inscriptions, and because of transaction fees, maybe we don't double this time. Maybe we only go up 50% because we don't have to have all of the money come from block rewards. So let's say we get to 75 as fair value. And again, the model will tell us what that fair value is, but you know, let's call it 75. 
Then what happens is we'll get to crypto fall, which is the June period post the halving. That's when the craziness starts to happen. That's when the FOMO happens. Then we get into Thanksgiving and everybody goes home and everybody's patting them on the back and come on in. You get two turkey legs this year, whereas two years ago you were, you're not invited anymore. You're disinvited. Humans are going to human, right? Humans are going to push this thing well beyond fair value. And then investors are going to come in and say, okay, it's time to get short. And they're going to collapse it. And it might be governments or banks that manipulate like they did with the futures and, you know, back in 17 and 21, who knows. But the bottom line is, is the reason we have this four-year cycle in crypto, it's driven by the code in Bitcoin. And the code is not going to change. Every four years, we're going to have a halving, which means every four years, there's going to be this upward pressure on price to reward the miners. That's going to draw in the speculators and ultimately the gamblers who FOMO in at the top. And then we're going to crash. And those crashes will always be worse than fair value, right? When, when you crash, you don't go to fair value, you go through fair value because people panic and shorts get liquidated. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, longs get liquidated, leverage longs get liquidated, not the shorts, the shorts make money. So I, I do think you're right that this cycle is exacerbated by the entrance of new ways to get demand. But that's been true of every cycle. Right. The first cycle, when it was a science project, suddenly you could buy it not in the back alley, literally where you had to meet somebody and you had to worry about getting hit in the back of the head with a wrench, to you could do it at Mount Gox. Right. And then that failed. And then you could have, you could do it at Coinbase or Kraken. And that not failed, but then that got dicey. And then you had this thing, GBTC. So the last cycle, people forget this, right? We went from 10,000 to 60,000 in about four months because GBTC got $10 billion of demand into their trust. That was what drove that cycle. Now, now also, you know, you had some uh, Michael, Sa Michael Saylor buying and you know you had a few others and you had elon's famous quote where you know we're not going to take it for tesla and it crashed remember it went from february down to june down 50 percent before it rallied into november when he's like oh i'm kidding you can go back and buy so there there was plenty of demand and what's going to happen every cycle is there's going to be a new avenue for demand so this cycle isn't the trust, GBTC, it's the ETFs. And the next cycle, it'll be, maybe it'll be derivative products, or maybe it'll be the institutionalization or the Wall Streetization. Or small and countries. Then, and then it'll be small countries. Then one of these cycles, it's going to be central banks. The point there is in crypto, yes, all of us watching this show and, and together in the crypto Twitter, we're all thinking the same way we're just a tiny little fraction, right? All the haters are still hating, right? Jamie Dimon, Elizabeth Warren, Gary Gensler. I mean, the guy has been beaten about the head and shoulders all year, lost case after case. Just give in, Gary, right? Just give in. He won't. He just keeps leading with his chin and you know, he keeps getting beat up. So the haters are still going to hate. And Vanguard, Merrill Lynch, UBS have all said, nope, we don't recognize this as a real asset. This is not, this is not like stocks, bonds, and cash. No, it's not. It's actually better, right? That's why you need it in your portfolio because it increases the sharp ratio of a diversified portfolio. So I, I am cognizant that even if it's just a small group, if literally everybody is thinking the same way, bad things can happen. But the difference now is 
there's so little external interest, you know, searches for Bitcoin, not very high. Um, people coming to you or me that, you know, we haven't talked to for a year saying, hey, how do I buy Bitcoin again? That's not really happening yet. It's starting on, on the edges, but it's, you look at the greed fear index, you know, we're not really in crazy greed yet. Now, Bitcoin yesterday was really overbought. We had a shooting star pattern, which short term is, is not very good. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm nervous short term. And the third, there's one more test coming mid-March to early April. There will be a selling wave where everybody realizes how much they owe Uncle Sam in taxes. And kind of the same, the other thing we didn't talk about was part of the sell pressure around the ETF launch was Lunar New Year. And this happens every single year, right before Lunar New Year, the Chinese need to sell some to fill up their red envelopes with cash. That's what they do. And that's their tradition. And every year there's a selling wave right before that. And then we bounce up. And then there's the selling wave going into tax season. And then we bounce up and, and we have a good summer but and good fall. But I, I think this, this selling wave could be big, right? Not only were profits huge last year, okay? So there's a lot of people that owe some taxes because there's there was a lot of trading. Um, it's now the fifth question on the 1040 form. Like, like literally, you know, what's your name? What's your address? What's your security number? I don't remember the fourth question, maybe your birthday. And do you own crypto? Like, really? Really? I mean, okay. So they can protest that, oh, we don't care about crypto. We hate crypto. But if you own it, we want to we wanna, we wanna, we wanna tax you on it. Well, that's actually the definition of money, right? Definition of money is something you can pay your taxes with. Now, they won't let us pay our taxes with it yet. But the fact that they want us to pay taxes on those gains is clear legitimization of, of the asset. So there's Mark Yusko on why we have begun an unprecedented Bitcoin bull run. Looking forward into 2024, it's clear that we're standing on the precipice of a major financial shift. Mark Yusko's insights have not only shed light on the current dynamics at play, but have also painted a vivid picture of what's to come. With over 300 billion poised to enter the Bitcoin market, driving its price to astonishing new heights, the future of crypto has never looked brighter. Mark's confidence, backed by surprising demand from giants like BlackRock and the potential involvement of central banks, underscores a critical turning point for Bitcoin. It's not just about the numbers, it's about the growing recognition of Bitcoin as a legitimate, invaluable asset in the global financial landscape. As we look forward to the rest of 2024, let's not forget the importance of staying informed and engaged in the crypto world. Whether you're a seasoned investor or new to the game, understanding the market nuances is key to navigating its ups and downs successfully. And remember, if you found value in today's content, don't hesitate to subscribe or hit the like button. Joining our community is a simple, free way to ensure you stay connected to the latest in finance and crypto. Plus, it supports the channel and allows us to bring you more insights like these. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best.